My name's Gus Silber and I'm chatting today to Fiona Snickers about her new novel, The Hidden. Fiona, just briefly sum up The Hidden for us. The Hidden, um, if one were to kind of define the genre, is a cross between an FBI thriller and domestic noir. But basically it's about an ordinary suburban family and the lengths that they will go to to protect the life that they've built and keep the secrets in the past. Um, they've escaped from something rather dreadful and they're wanting to keep the past hidden. Great. Before we delve into the hidden, I'd like to ask you about one of your early works. It's a story about three cat burglars who break into a rich man's home and pretty much make off with everything. And was published on the children's page of the Star when you were 10 years old. That's right. Was that the start of your literary career? And did you personally know those three cats? <laughs> it was the start of my literary career. Um, it, it amuses me in retrospect now to think about it. I think I, I remember the sense of righteousness that I felt in writing it. And I think small children are natural socialists. So the sort of forcible redistribution of wealth just struck me as so right and just, you know. There's a, a rich man with a home that's full of jewels and uh, artworks and what have you, and clearly it behoves these two mischievous cats to break in and steal everything. Like, it, it, it was so self-evidently just to me that I look back on my younger self and I really laugh because um, I think I've maybe moved on a bit since then. But yes, mischievous felines have always been in my life. And what did it mean to you as a 10-year-old to see your words in print? It was truly a wonderful moment. Um, I, I remember it so vividly. I was proud of it then and I'm proud of it now. And chasing that sort of seeing name in print thing is something that I've I've just carried right on doing. And it never gets old to sort of hold in your hand a book that you wrote and see your name on the cover it still is a thrill. It still is quite something. I haven't got tired of it. Have you still got the original article on the style? Did you keep it? You know, I think I do have it somewhere. I think my mom kept it, and I saw it recently, and I was like, oh, yes, that happened, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Fiona, I'd like to ask you, because I'm quite interested in this, um, do dreams play any role in your writing process? Because I think in our dreams we subconsciously and unconsciously tell amazing stories. Usually we forget about them the moment we wake up. Do you ever wake up with a plot line, with a character, with anything related to the book that you're working on that you can actually use in your writing? You know, I've, I've heard writers say this. I've heard them say that specifically characters or a character's voice will visit them in a dream. Um, I've heard writers say that uh, they've tried to kill off a character and that character came to them in a dream and said, I'm not ready to die. And then they've got to think of a way to sort of bring the character back to life. I haven't had exactly that. It's more feelings and impetus. Um, if I am dreaming just before waking up, then I might wake up and sort of vaguely remember some of what was going on there. But it's more the feeling that it gives me. Um, feeling of triumph or sadness or disappointment or whatever. And that feeling can stay with me and become the impetus for something I might write on that day. Okay. So in other words, your dreams in some way kind of shape your writing emotionally. Emotionally, yes. Okay. Yes. Not specific plot points. Okay, great. Now, Truman Capote, um, very famous writer, uh, he wrote In Cold Blood, a nonfiction slightly fictionalized story about a brutal murder in a small Kansas rural town. And he was inspired to write that book after reading a very short story in the New York Times, hidden way deep in the pages. Um, was The Hidden inspired in any way directly by anything you read in print or online? It very much was, but not by a specific incident. It was more a kind of patchwork of things that I'd been reading at the time, um, things that seemed to, to me to point to a, a threat to American stability that was coming from the ultra-right, the white ultra-right. Uh, and it seemed to me that this threat was being very much ignored and pushed under the carpet and that at some point it was going to break loose. And, um, you know, I was probably... They talk about confirmation bias. I was probably looking for articles that were reinforcing this opinion of mine. But while I was writing The Hidden, of course, the storming of the Capitol happened, yes. which seemed to 
bear out all the things that I was afraid of. And then I kind of quickly incorporated it in the book as well. Okay. When you're writing characters in Hidden and Elsewhere who hold views or values that are diametrically opposed to your own, how do you kind of present those characters as authentic and real and convincing rather than as vehicles for your own political and social views? Well, it remains to be seen whether I've done that successfully, but uh, I, I like to, in an imaginative way, inhabit the voice of a character, um, the heroes, the baddies, and everyone in between. Um, I, I kind of have a, a dialogue soundtrack in my head, and it takes me a moment to switch into that, and then I can at least try to write in the voice of that person. And this book, The Hidden, is it, it, it's divided into chapters which are told from particular characters' points of view, and they're all very different characters with different registers and different voices. So breathe, take a moment, get that voice back going in my head, okay, now I can type, now I can get on with it. So it, it's a kind of imaginative inhabiting of another consciousness, and really only the readers can tell me whether I've done it successfully or not. Uh, Fiona, kind of central event in your book is a big terror attack that occurs at a business park on May the 12th. And this gets referred to as the uh, attacks on May the 12th, just as 911 is enshrined in history as the date of those big terror attacks. Um, was there any particular reason that you chose May 12th? In my own research, I see it was, for instance, the day of the last battle of the American Civil War. Was it just a random date, or did you specifically look for a date that would have meaning in American history? Not in American history. It was a much more practical and pragmatic reason than that. I needed it to be towards the end of the school term uh, because this is a family with teenagers and I needed them to be finishing up the academic term and going into their summer holiday. So I, I originally had, I think, a completely different time of the year and wrote myself into a bit of a corner there and realized, okay, no, think now. Uh, May, uh, the, the school's gone holiday in sort of June or end of June, uh, count back six weeks, okay, May 12. And also I like the way it sounded because 9-11, yeah. May 12, it just sounded good to me. So that's what I went with. While you were writing the book, did you kind of have to almost become an American in the sense that you had to see things through American eyes rather than as somebody outside. I mean, even though we live in a completely connected world, uh, did you have to kind of almost physically imagine yourself as living in the U.S.? Yes. Uh, I think we already consume a disproportionate amount of American-generated culture. So we all have the, the different voices in our heads from time to time, you know, whether you're watching Netflix or whatever it might be. Um, so I, I did make a conscious effort to watch American TV, to listen to American podcasts, to read and consume American media and try to get some kind of voice going in my head. Um, so the research that I did for the book was, it happened basically during lockdown. So no one was going anywhere. And I have been to America on three or four occasions, but not to those specific places that I talk about. So my research was all online, Google Earth, Google Maps, uh, blogs, people who perhaps have escaped a survivalist cult and lived to write about their experience, that kind of thing. So I, w I was very much consuming at second hand um, cultural artifacts that related to what I was hoping to write about. I just want to pick up on lockdown and the pandemic. Uh, it just seems kind of like it happened just the other day, but it was 2019, 2020, and 2021. How did the pandemic affect you as a writer? How did it affect the way you write? How did it affect the way you think this kind of being sealed off from the world and yet connected to it? Did it affect you in any way that, that has lingered? It's in. As we went into lockdown, I thought, oh, I'm so perfectly suited for this because the writer, the life of a writer is very insular and cut off. You mostly are in a room on your own, uh, in your own head and producing works of imagination. So I thought nothing would really change. But I think we all became familiar with 
the tendency to doom scroll and sort of watch this thing unfolding and feel very anxious about it and perhaps not sleep well. So it, it was a time when the world for me felt very out of control. And writing this book, which at the time I was not at all sure would be published, because it was the first time I'd ever set a book outside of South Africa. And publishers usually don't publish books by South Africans not set in South Africa with no South African themes whatsoever. So it kind of felt like it was between me and my laptop. And it, it was an attempt to create a world where I was in control. Donald Trump was not in control. <laughs> the pandemic was not in control. So it, it was a kind of therapeutic exercise. It was an attempt to control a world that at the time felt very out of control. The title of your book is very resonant. It suggests hidden things on so many different levels, dysfunctional families, societies in chaos, emotions that we hide from ourselves and each other. Was it the original title that you came up with that it kind of presented itself to you as you wrote? It was not. Um, I, I don't think I'm giving away secrets by telling you that it was originally called The Woman with a Secret. Um, and actually, she's a woman with several secrets that get revealed during the course of the book. And it was called that throughout the writing process. Uh, it's not a good title. Um, we had really come to the end of books that were the woman and the girl. Uh, they were getting very tired by the time this book uh, was ready to be published. So I needed a rethink. And yes, I just like that the hidden because it, it covers a multitude of themes in the book. Um, and when I came up with it, I was thinking specifically of this survivalist community that just melts away into the night when once they have committed the deed that they commit, they just melt away. They just vanish from sight. So they were the original the hidden that I was thinking of. Were you at all worried to the extent that you would ever wake up and ask yourself why you were doing this about the whole kind of prospect of tackling such huge subjects in another country, terrorism, cults, dysfunction, et cetera, et cetera? Was that a concern for you or did you just fearlessly kind of tackle it head on? I think because at the time of writing, I really thought this book might never see the light of day. This is just me and my laptop telling a story that I personally was burning to tell and that freed me from self-consciousness. Um, and I, I just tackled the material fairly fearlessly. I've since had second thoughts, but <laughs> it's too late now because the book's already out. But um, no, at the time, I, I didn't feel inhibited about what I was writing about. Okay. I'd just like to ask you about your kind of first reader process. I mean, obviously, you are the first reader of your book, but somebody at some point has got to read your book and either in the process or after it's published. Do you have a trusted and preferred first reader, whether in your household or elsewhere? I'm thinking about the kind of first reader who will be openly critical rather than just kind of nod and say, it's great, keep it up. Usually, my, my first reader was always my husband, um, and he usually still is, but he is of the it's great, keep it up kind of ilk, <laughs> which is maybe what you need when it really is the first time you're showing it to someone. You just need that reassurance. And then my older daughter is my kind of Thai first reader or my second reader, and she will be critical in a very useful way. She'll usually tell me that I've rushed the ending. Um, which is my besetting sin. I kind of, I'm like a horse smelling the stable and I start to gallop um, and kind of wrap things up far too quickly. And she tells me, no, no, slow it down. This needs a couple of chapters. And I never want to hear that. I'm done with this book. I, I don't want any more chapters. Um, but it, it's always good to hear that. And the book always benefits from that input. And this particular book, one of the very earliest readers was uh, Georgina Guedes, um, who runs a book reading group on Facebook. And I, I was at a point where I couldn't see the wood for the trees with this book anymore. Uh, and I gave it to her, and she also gave me some really, really helpful plot feedback, which helped make the book a lot better. You mentioned your older daughter. I'm just wondering, when you're writing a book like The Hidden, 
um, with very adult themes and very adult scenes. Do you ever think to yourself, oh, I wonder what my kids are going to think? And do you ever kind of uh, hesitate to let them read those scenes? Uh, I don't hesitate. They they always welcome to read them. And um, my older daughter, when she was reading it, I knew she'd got to the big plot twist because I just heard her start yelling in her room, Mom, how could you? Oh, why? You know, and then I thought, oh, okay, she's got to that part. <laughs> and my son read it recently and he said to me, this would have been a very good book if you hadn't written it, Mom. <laughs> So there's a little bit of generational influence in your writing. Okay, great. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I read in an interview that you did that you see writing as a form of therapy. Uh, and here you're tackling very dark subjects. So would you say that writing as therapy then is kind of cost effective or do you ever feel the need to have post-writing therapy once you've tackled these deep subjects? Not really. Um Putting something on the page, working it out in my head in a coherent way and putting it on the page is so healing for me personally. I don't write it and then get traumatized by that act and then sort of need further therapy. I mean, it's a totally separate question whether I need therapy full stop. My children would say yes. <laughs> but to me, if there is something niggling away, something that's been bothering me for a long time, if I can make it coherent and put it on the page, as I say, that's very, very healing. It works very well for me. Do you have any kind of ritual when you kind of finish a book or when you actually get a proof copy of your book that you go out and indulge or treat yourself to some little luxury? You know, I used to. Um, my husband had a thing that when I was nearing the end of a book or – no, it was actually when a book is formally accepted for publication, he would put a bottle of champagne in the fridge. And then that night, he and I would split it to celebrate the book having been accepted. And we did that for years. And now I basically don't drink anymore. So that's gone by the wayside. But it's, it's still always a thrill. I love it. So the book is kind of its own reward for you. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, excellent. Fiona, I think we live in probably the most information-rich age in history. Uh, we carry around with us devices that kind of connect us to an entire world of information, whether in book form or news form or, or many other different forms. Why do you think in this ubiquitous information age we still need traditional novels? Why are they still important? I don't think they're important for everyone, but for people who want to have the world organized into narrative, um, not just nonfiction, but but a, a fictional constructed narrative. I think there's still a huge appetite for that, maybe even a growing appetite. I think um, that different media like Instagram and, and TikTok have actually brought more authors to books rather than keeping authors away from books, which I think was the fear. They've actually help books to go viral and drawn in new young uh, readers who are going to consume this material. Um, and for me, if I know that a thing really happened, I'm interested in it in a, a superficial kind of way. If I know that this story was made up by someone, that draws me in. Uh, just that, that knowledge that this is fictional, it didn't really happen. Um, is a, a big draw card for me. And I, I think this is a gendered thing. Um, I think it seems that women are more drawn to fiction and men are more drawn to nonfiction. Um, but certainly for me, if I know I am watching or listening to or reading the product of someone's imagination, that's incredibly compelling. So The Hidden is set in an unnamed, unspecified year, but it's obviously a post-Trump America, and of course we're now looking as if we may actually be in for another Trump America. God, it's very God. topical. Um, there's so much happening in America now that I think your book resonates with. One of the big upcoming movies 
in America is actually called civil war, which is actually about the next civil war in the U.S. And these are very, very much um, touch points. Um, did it kind of surprise you that the book in some ways kind of was so hotly topical or did you kind of hope that it would turn out to be topical? One of the points I'll just quickly mention, in your book, domestic terrorism is actually a federal crime, mm -hmm. which it's currently not. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about, uh, about it being a federal crime. So in some sense... You've kind of, it's almost turned into a kind of prophecy of what might happen. Uh, how is that kind of top of mind for you, kind of the topicality of your book and almost seeing it as something that could kind of occur in a future America? I think it, it related to my wish to control what was happening because it did feel very out of control and once again feels very out of control with the possibility of a Trump presidency looming again, which I still can't quite believe. Um, there was a time during the Obama years where it really seemed as though America and the whole world was on a trajectory of openness, liberality, that we were entering a, a kinder age, a more inclusive age, and that th this was an unstoppable momentum. And since then, there's been a real backlash, um, the kind of last kickings of the white patriarchal system um, which have proven much more powerful, I think, than anyone anticipated. And we're still living through that. And I, I believe that in the end, the trajectory towards kindness and openness will prevail. But in the meantime, we're living through a very painful era. So it's something that I certainly was aware that other people were thinking about because I was reading their musings on the subject. It was a topic that concerned me greatly and still does. Uh, and people say to me, you know, you live in South Africa. Why do you care what's going on in America? And I always say there's a saying that when America sneezes, the whole world catches a cold. And I could see those talking points of the culture wars making their way onto our shores and becoming talking points of our politicians and our leaders of civic life, which is very distressing. So it was just something that was top of mind for me. And... um I, I know I'm not the only one who is thinking like that. And it was a kind of a slight future that I was envisioning. But exactly how sticky and determined the the far right would prove to be and, and how powerful and how capable of resurgence at the time of writing, I had no idea. Yeah. Um I just want to ask you uh, about artificial intelligence, which is a big, big topic nowadays, and particularly for anyone who works in any creative field or industry. Do you use AI tools at all? Are you fearful or hopeful about the influence of AI in your field writing? I have never used the tools. Um, it's such a tricky one. I used to think I had made up my mind on the subject and that I knew how I felt about it, but it kind of sways from day to day because that's another thing that is in such flux that I really don't feel as though I've got a grip on it. Uh, at times it, it seems as though, oh, these are wonderful new tools that we can use that can benefit everybody. And then at other times it's, oh, the robots are coming for, for us, you know, they're going to be no more artists, they're going to be no more writers, the the days of the creative imagination are numbered. Um, I don't believe it. The trajectory of history suggests that when new disruptive new tools arrive, there is a lot of fear and a lot of uh, panic, and then everything settles down and humanity continues on its course of innovation and creation and so I like to believe that's what's going to happen. But there are times when I go onto social media and I see some terrible scare story and I'm very much in an industry that feels threatened by the influence of AI, but I, I don't really believe it. I think this is a uh, an adjustment period and ultimately we'll carry on creating as we always were. Do you still dictate your books and then kind of transcribe? Um. Not anymore. That that was something that served me well at a period in my life when I had children at home and a lot of distractions and I often couldn't sit down and type. So I would be driving somewhere and um, dictating or uh, doing something, cooking and dictating. Um, and, and that served me very well at the time. But 
now I, I do have time and space in my life to sit down with my laptop and write. So at the moment, that's what I'm doing. Great. I think like any society, we tend to be quite self-absorbed in South Africa with our own world and our own politics. And life here is never, ever boring. There's enough to occupy our minds uh, in our cities and in our nation as a whole. Was it for you a form of escape, a form of liberation to pull yourself out of the milieu of South African politics and society and totally plunge yourself into a society thousands of kilometers away? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think not, because at the time I was so worried about what was happening in America and what its influence could be on us. Um, and I'm writing again, and I'm back in South Africa. My setting is South Africa again, and I feel very at home and comfortable here. Uh, so I wouldn't say it was a relief. It was more like that seemed more urgent to me. It seemed like something that at the time required my attention, um, you know, in that sort of vain way of authors. But, uh, um, yeah, it, 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 it wasn't a relief to escape South Africa. In a way, it's a relief to be back and setting a book in South Africa again. Okay. Did you experience any form of culture shock while writing the book because you were kind of dealing with the politics and the language and the entire kind of uh, values of a very different society, or were you kind of for the purpose, for the time that you wrote the book, in effect, an American? Um, the law enforcement procedural issues were very strange to me. The whole idea of a federal system, a federal versus state, the different branches of law enforcement and how they cooperate or don't cooperate with each other, that was all very foreign. And um, I needed to kind of immerse myself in that world just to understand what on earth was going on. It's very different to the way we do things here. Um, I think there's a, a great similarity uh, if you are – white, middle class, and suburban, you will find a familiarity all over the world. Australia, the UK, America, New Zealand, South Africa, there's there's a great commonality, um, a, a lot of sameness of concerns and issues. But the one big, big difference was the FBI procedural issue. And uh, I actually, in my book, credit a podcast that I listened to continuously for two years, which was the FBI retired case file review, where a retired FBI agent interviews fellow retired agents about their old cases, and they really break it down, what happened, when the case first came across their desk, exactly how they tackled it moment to moment in a very granular way with a lot of detail. And she also talks about how the FBI is often misrepresented in popular culture. Um, but she said a thing which I found very useful, which is the story comes first. If you have to choose between rendering exactly how the FBI would do this thing in real life versus telling a good story, the story must triumph every time. Um, serve the story first and get the details right later don't let the story suffer for the sake of the details. And being given permission to do that was very freeing for me. Right. Now, in the hidden, in this post-Trump America, the president is a woman. But you don't delve deeply into who the president is and what her thoughts are and how she actually operates. Was that a choice you made in the sitcom series Veep, which is one of my favorites, the president is just a presence in the background and he's actually never seen. And yet we kind of know that the president is there and we kind of feel the president's presence in every scene. How did you make the choice in particular, that the fact that you chose a woman president? How did that kind of uh, influence the way that you wrote her presence as almost kind of invisible? Yeah, um, it, it was, I guess, a bit of wishful thinking. You know, there was a time when we came pretty close to having a woman president in America, and that didn't happen, which felt sad to me. Um, so it was wishful thinking. But the, this this nebulous president does exert influence on the book because she is putting pressure on the 
head of the FBI who's putting pressure on the deputy director who's putting pressure on my character, my investigator. And um, there's a, a sort of pressure to make everything look good, not necessarily solve the crime at all case, but to be seen to solve the crime is more important. The sort of public relations exercise is more important than what's actually happening. And some poor decisions or rash decisions are made because of this tremendous pressure to look good just for the media rather than just following the evidence, but just make it happen, make it seem as though there has been a breakthrough in this case, whether there has or hasn't. And that leads to bad decisions, which are, you know, being passed on from higher up. So just that. And I, I mean, I don't think that a woman president would be immune to that kind of thing. But I didn't want to involve her as a character. So she's just a sort of force from above, exerting force downstream, which causes people to behave in not ideal ways. The fact that you have her in the hidden obviously means that you could at some point kind of bring her to the forefront um, in a future novel or, or a sequel. It's quite interesting that both Obama and Trump are also kind of presences in the background of your book. You kind of feel this kind of hope of the Obama years and the chaos and madness of the of the Trump years. So it's quite interesting that you've got almost three presidents uh, present somehow in your book. Tell me a little bit about your understanding of survivalism and that kind of cult. Um, do you think that it's a real threat? I mean, we've been reading a lot, for instance, about uh, Texas and about the prospect, the very real prospect, or at least the spoken prospect of a possible civil war. How do you feel about that kind of ultra um, white supremacist survivalist mentality? What, what are your thoughts on it? Well, I think if, if you look in the recent history of America, like Waco, for example, you can see that uh, isolated communities can become very militarized. The access to weapons is obviously basically unfettered and very dangerous. And situations can arise where people who've been very isolated just go completely rogue and and cause violence and chaos. So it, it certainly can happen. Um, and I think people did not see the attack on the Capitol coming. Um, I've since learned that there are even more of these isolated religious communities than I ever imagined. And I've heard lots of interesting things about how they each have their own kind of origin story, a sort of mystical thing that happened um, stretching maybe 80 to 100 years in the past when a tornado hit, but one man's barn was spared. And he then became the leader and the anointed of God and created this little community where, you know, he is the splinter leader of these people. Um I had no idea how common it was in bits of rural America. Um, so in many ways, I think, you know, the story I told is an effective story, but the real threat probably comes from uh, more conventional evangelical communities, the the money they have, how powerful they are as a lobby group, um, the disproportionate influence they have over American politics and American policy. That's probably more of a real threat, but you know, with all those guns floating around, anything can happen. One thing I really liked about The Hidden is that it presents America for what it is, a very complex and huge society that is often stereotyped or reduced to one particular type of thing or one particular point of view. Uh, you know, there's no such thing really, I think, as a typical American. There just isn't. Are you planning to revisit America either for a sequel to The Hidden or for some other project? A sequel to The Hidden, definitely. Um, alongside the South African book that I'm writing, I'm also writing the sequel to The Hidden. And I'm about 40,000 words deep into that. Um, and yeah, The Hidden has a sort of surprise ending, which could also be interpreted as a bit of a cliffhanger ending, even though most of the storylines are wrapped up by the end of the book. But there's something that's left loose and dangling, and that is the thing that I'm now tackling in the sequel. Um, and yes, you're quite right. There is no one America. In fact, I think half of it's what makes it great and what makes it flawed is the fact that it is so very disparate. 
the the coasts versus the so-called flyover states versus the south versus the Pacific Northwest. It, it's all so different and so interesting. And it certainly is rich terrain to to write about or create something about. So if you're only looking back at your 10-year-old self at this kind of nascent uh, little socialist, <laughs> uh, do you still kind of have those feelings of youthful idealism that kind of dictated that story to you? Have you become more weathered and cynical over the years? Or do you still, when you're writing in on some level, want to project at least the hope of a, a better society, a better world? I definitely have some elements of a utopian outlook. I do imagine that a better world is possible and desirable and that we should all be striving towards it. And in, in writing, I, I certainly don't write kind of overwhelmingly optimistic books, but I write to try to point out where I think things are going wrong, maybe with a view to people thinking, okay, how can we now set this right? I mean, this is very idealistic. And yes, with age, obviously, one becomes uh, more cynical or at least more skeptical about how things are going to turn out. Um, and I'm constantly surprised both by how things can unexpectedly go well and then how they can unexpectedly go incredibly badly. Um, so I, I'm certainly, I am an optimist. It's not always reflected in my writing, but I do believe in and, and hope for a better future. If you had to meet the characters in your book, especially the hidden in real life, do you kind of feel you'd have to run away from them or apologize <laughs> to them or engage them in dialogue to change their ways? <laughs> um, I think my, my one suburban mom character uh, would probably be very familiar to me. Um, I think I, I based her, the, the aspects of her suburban momness, very much on myself. Um, her teenagers are kind of familiar because they're loosely based on what were my own teenagers at the time. Um, and uh, my investigator, I would like to have a stern talking to to her <laughs> because. I think she's heading off on quite a, a dangerous and damaging trajectory and um, she's not behaving any better in the sequel. So I do think I need to have a, a chat with her. Um, and as for the, the villains, well, yeah, I like to see them getting their comeuppance in fiction. So when you're working on a book like The Hidden, which immerses you in uh, a different country, a different culture and so on, do you tend to... Uh, immerse yourself in books, uh, movies, series related to that culture, or do you kind of isolate yourself from other influences that may get in the way of your own story? I used to do the latter. Um, if I was writing a book, I wouldn't be reading much because I have this chameleon tendency, which I think a lot of authors have, that I start taking on the voice that I'm reading in my writing. So if I was for example, uh, reading P.G. Woodhouse, who I do love, that style is very, very infectious and would start creeping into my writing, so I would have to stop reading it. But I, I think I've maybe become less chameleon-like and I can um, immerse myself and consume a whole lot of different cultural products. I'm always listening to something or watching something or reading something. Um, but it does help if you are trying to mimic something that is not yours to immerse yourself and have it in your ears and in your eyes and in your imagination all the time. It definitely does help. Fiona, did you have a first American reader for this book? And what sort of reaction did you get from somebody who actually lives and dwells in that society? Well, um, not to toot my own horn, but the book was optioned for screen before publication. And the production company that bought the option uh, has an American woman who is affiliated to them. And she read it and, uh, you know, told me a, a couple of things that I'd got wrong, but they were pretty minor. Um, she was happy with most of what I'd, I'd done. But she is the one who told me that I have no idea how many of these isolated communities there are and how they each have their own little origin story. And uh, what she told me there was so interesting that it became a seed for the sequel. 
Um, so that one fully American person who's read it gave me enough approval so that I feel confident now about writing the sequel. Oh, that must have been very validating for you. When you write, um, do you tend to write cinematically? Do you see scenes actually happening in your head as if they were happening on a TV screen, leaving aside any prospects of eventual dramatization in the visual form? How do you kind of um, break down your scenes so that the reader sees them the way you see them? I see things kinetically. So I see people moving in space and time. And I also hear dialogue in my head. What I'm not great at, at, so visually, the people moving, yes, I've got that nailed. Visually, in terms of place, I have to concentrate more to get that right. And very often, I'll be told, okay, this is all great, but where is it happening? What What is this room they're in? Or they're out in nature, what does it look like? And then I have to think about what you can see, what you can smell, what you can hear, and add those details in to make the world richer. So my strength, I think, is dialogue and people moving in space, which is a sort of cinematic thing. But that whole cinematic backdrop is something that I have to be more conscious of. I'm curious, especially from the dialogue point of view, do you ever pause in your writing and start reading the dialogue aloud to yourself to hear how it sounds? I don't. I sometimes recommend that to other people, but I don't take my own advice. I hear it in my head. It's like um, I imagine tuning a piano where, you know, people can tune by ear and they just keep striking the same note over and over and tuning it and tuning it until it sounds right. So I just keep reading a paragraph over and over in my head until the music sounds right, and then I can move on to the next one. Great. Who's your favorite fictional, either in a book or in uh, the visual format, FBI agent, the one who you kind of might have influenced your uh, character? Is there anyone in particular who comes to mind? Um, I'm a big fan of Michael Connolly's Bosch series, okay. and Earlier on in the series, he is married to, okay, I got the name, Eleanor Wish is his wife, and she's an FBI agent. And she was such an, an awesome, amazing character, also flawed in various ways, as Michael Connolly's characters are. But I think she was in the background of my head when I was creating the story. Uh, you know, she gets killed quite early on in the series, which was a great loss, but she remains his true love, Bosch's true love and inspiration, and he's now raising her daughter. So that character that he decided to kill off remains my inspiration. I think flawed characters are always so much more interesting in fiction, especially characters who are supposed to be paragons of virtue and moral righteousness. And I don't know if you're familiar with True Detective, the latest season of it, where Jodie I'm Foster... I'm dying to yeah, start reading that. You really that. must. Yeah. She plays such a brilliant character who is flawed and broken in so many ways, and she's working on an incredibly difficult case. And in fact, while watching it, I often thought of your Arctic book. Mm -hmm. It kind of just brought that to mind. So have a look at it. I'm sure you'll mm -hmm. love it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, Fiona, to wrap up, you strike me as a very fearless writer. You take great risks. You move from genre to genre. Uh, you seem restless. Um, you're not afraid to tackle big subjects, uh, and nor are you afraid to tackle subjects very close to home. But what about every writer's biggest fear, the one-star Amazon review? <laughs> How do you feel about that sort of reception when your book is released into the wild and it's no longer your book, it belongs to the reader? How do you feel about the prospect of getting negative criticism and one-star reviews, especially from people who just want to be negative? Well, I think I've been through the furnace on this one with my book, Lacuna. Um, it got very, very mixed reviews. Some people loved it and some people truly hated it and then extended that hatred to me personally. <laughs> um, and it, it bothered me a lot more. And I have to give you credit, Gus, because we talked about the role of the reviewer in a podcast episode that we did together. And I remember you telling me about um, an actress that you had once interviewed 
who said that she doesn't read her reviews, she measures them. You know, how, how long a review was it? And just the fact of being reviewed at all is an honor. The fact of your books being a talking point is an honor. And that really helped me to let go of stuff. I was carrying a lot of anger. Um, I, I could quote you from reviews of things that people said that struck me as so palpably unfair or ungenerous or unkind or whatever, really took it to heart. And I've been able to let a lot of that go. Um, people will say what they're going to say and think what they're going to think. There is no author who has succeeded in any way who hasn't had the sort of really biting, sarcastic review. And people, reviewers often want to build their own reputation on the back of an author or of a TV series or whatever. And very often the only new take that they can bring is to hate it, <laughs> is to hate a thing that has been uh, very much loved elsewhere to point out its flaws and to sort of build a case against it. And it's fine. I've, I've developed a lot of peace towards that. Um, I no longer go on to Goodreads and look at the reviews, <laughs> which is very good for my mental health. Um, so far, the reception to The Hidden has been good. There have been intimations that, you know, possibly it's a little extreme or uh, people kind of openly wondering about the state of my mental health to have produced <laughs> such an extreme book, um, which is amusing and also fine. I can let it go. So let me close by asking about your really brilliant podcast series with Gail Schimmel, The Hidden Lives of Writers. And it struck me that there's that word again, the hidden. Mm. Um, so in some way, you're showcasing writers, you're delving into the way they work and the way they think. Is there any particular unifying lesson that you've learned from all the different and diverse writers that you and Gail have spoken to that strikes you? Is there anything, in, in other words, that writers tend to have in common something that you've related to, something that has influenced the way you now work? You know, it's hard to isolate one thing. Every one of those interviews, Gail and I both find so inspiring that we almost want to rush home and start writing. Um, and, and each writer brings some new little insight to the table, uh, like Craig Higginson saying that um, – he will write in the spaces of the day that allow it. And he described it as water flowing over floorboards and, and finding its level and slipping into the cracks. And his creativity slips into the cracks of the day. Um, he's a very busy person. He's got a very demanding day job. But in those little cracks in the day, he will just write a few words, get a few hundred words written. And that was so inspiring. And there have been so many others like that, writers talking about their process, what works for them, their inspiration, uh, the hardships they've overcome, uh, how they've got over writer's block. It's It brings me to life to talk to them and to hear what they've done um, and, and the things that have worked and haven't worked for them. So it, it's very difficult to sum it into one thing except to say that writers are very, very interesting people. Um, and if you have a, a long time to talk to them, like a full hour to really go into things in depth, it's very rewarding. It certainly is for me and for Gail. Yeah. I think what you and Gail are doing with your series is allowing people who paradoxically very often struggle to express themselves and struggle often to talk about their work. In fact, very often the worst thing you can do as a writer is say, I'm a writer, <laughs> because it leads to all sorts of torturous kind of paths that you have to navigate down. So by allowing writers to interview writers, I think you're doing something that's really fascinating, but also um, important. So you're a very busy writer. You mentioned earlier that you're writing a South African novel plus the sequel to The Hidden. Is there any particular antidote that you have to writing, any activity, any obsession that takes you completely out of the world of writing and gets you away from your laptop for a while? I would have to say that it, it's exercise and especially going for a long walk um, and also podcasts. Uh, I like to walk and listen to podcasts at the same time and I find that really clears my head, blows out the cobwebs, um, I often start off thinking, 
oh, I'm, I'm probably going to work out this plot line now while I'm, I'm walking and listening. But then I end up not doing that. I, I just go into a different zone, which is very, very pleasant. Um, and, uh, and then come back to the laptop feeling quite refreshed. So I would say that exercise is my current head clearing drug of choice. <laughs> That's good to hear, especially the walking box. I think walking and writing go together very, very well. Um, thank you very much, Fiona. And uh, uh, Fiona's and Gail's podcast, The Hidden Lives of Writers, very well worth listening to. And The Hidden is published by Pan Macmillan, and it's uh, available, as they say, at all good bookstores and probably even a few not-so-good bookstores. Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you, Gus. Another production from Solid Gold Podcasts.